Good morning, guys. I hope that y'all are well. It is an honor and a blessing to be with you this morning. I have been at Camp Sumatanga. We finished VBS. I drove up to Gallant, Alabama, about 30 minutes from here to start prepping for senior high week at Camp Sumatanga yesterday. We worked on backdrops and painting and meeting the team and laughing at silly stuff and telling stories. And it was a great way to have a Saturday. And I got up this morning and I drove back in so that I could be here to preach and I'll turn back around after the service and go back and I'll be at Sumatanga leading camp there until Friday with teenagers from all over North Alabama. And it is an honor and a blessing to do that. But I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be here with you guys today, especially after having a hundred and some odd children in the church for VBS this week and almost as many volunteers. That doesn't happen very frequently. A hundred plus or so volunteers to go along with a hundred and plus or so children. What an unbelievable outpouring of support. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we've, we've been in a busy season here. Summertime is often that way. I hear from friends who are like, oh, well, it's summer. The church slows down. I was like, in what world does the church slow down in the summer? That does not happen. We have things like VBS and camps and all sorts of stuff. Melanie and uh, a team will be going up next week for uh, day camp. I mean, it's nonstop in the church. And sometimes I wonder if we don't get caught up in the idea that the things that we do, the stuff that we put ourselves to, the things that we desire to accomplish might be where we begin to place our identity and see our value and worth. It is really easy to think, man, we knocked it out of the park with 100 plus children this week or that we're going to have 75 or 80 students this week at Sumatanga. And as wonderful as those numbers are and as great as it is to have the massive number of volunteers as I see your yellow shirts throughout the worship space, those are commendable things, but our identity is not found in the stuff that we do. Our identity is not in success. Our identity is not in the number of people that show up to worship. Our identity should be in God and God alone. And I think that we're in a culture these days that tells us that we can pretty much pick whatever we want to to be our defining characteristic. To the point of setting down God and taking up lots of other things. And in a world that teaches that and preaches that, we have got to be a people that demonstrate and illustrate what it is to be defined by God alone. Because that is the only thing that redeems us. The life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the redemption that he provides us with, the righteousness that only he can give us, that is our identity. And though it is great for us to celebrate when things go well, and there is nothing at all wrong with that, we must recognize that everything that we have is a blessing from God above. This week, we're going to be coming out of the book of Acts. It's one of my favorite books. I, I love it because we get to see what the early church looks like. We get to see the struggles and the challenges of the early church. We get to see what happens when people begin to really put their faith in God and allow him to work in powerful ways as thousands and thousands of people come to the saving grace that comes through Christ alone. And in the midst of the, the, the message of Acts, we, we encounter this person who probably is a lot more like us than we'd care to admit. His name is Paul. And Paul had a rough history. He had persecuted Christians. He had been responsible for their, their, their killing and their imprisonment. He, he had played a part in the detriment of the church. And then one day on a road to Damascus, his life has changed forever. No longer is his identity found in his position, but his identity is found in his position on his knees before the throne of God. It's not about what he could do. It's not about persecution. It's not about bringing people to what he perceived in his early life to be justice. Instead, it is about recognizing that God has a plan and a purpose and it's greater than anything that we could ever imagine. God's plan and purpose and his ability to exceed your expectations is as valid for your life, every single one of you, as it was for Paul's. And so Paul having been transformed, having been made
Check, check. Hey, look at that. The wonder of technology. Not today, Satan. Um, <laughs> for sure. So Paul winds up in this transformed life, and we wind up encountering him in Acts 17. If you guys want to stand for the reading of God's word, it'll be presented on the screen behind me. And when we're done, I'll finish with the word of God for the people of God, and you will say, thanks be to God. That's good stuff. All right, let's dig in. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Oropagus, said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation and mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of you, some of your own prophets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. I believe he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. I think in some ways we, we see superstition happen in the world around us this day. And in those places, we're intended to be a people that demonstrate what it is to have faith in a God that is faithful. Not faith in a God that we create with our own hands. And these people put forth lots of effort creating this art and this beauty. Yeah, that's great. But I can assure you, there's very little in the world that I could create that is worthy of worship. I'd go so far as to say there's nothing that I can create that's worthy of worship. And I'd equally assert there's nothing you can create that's worthy of worship. Because to place our faith and our worship upon things that are made by the hands of man is to miss the transcendent and yet engaging nature of our great God who creates each of us. We find the beauty of that story in Genesis. In Genesis 1, it's a cosmic perspective that God is in the heavens speaking creation into being. The first three words of the Hebrew Bible are Berashith, bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created. And the beauty of that creation is that unlike the gods that the people of Athens worshipped, he did that creation through word. It was not violence and destruction. It was not explosiveness and dynamics. It was the world coming into existence through the spoken word of our great God. And so this God who creates in this way that is totally different and who gives life and breath and meaning and movement and passion and purpose to that which he creates. That is what Paul is preaching in the Oropagus. He encounters a people who want what is new. Roger! <laughs> Are we good? Hey, look, it's back. That went away for a second, right? Okay, just making sure. It didn't? Felt like it did. Thank you, Bradley. It's nice of you. It's good. But he goes into this place and he begins to give them a truth that transcends time of a God that is responsible for the creation of all things. And I love that he does this within a way that they can comprehend it. 
Because though they recognize the desire for knowledge, they also recognize the finite nature of themselves and they had created an altar that was dedicated to an unknown God, a God that they had yet to encounter. And Paul walks in and says, oh, you have left an opening for me because the God that you list as unknown is the one true God of all things. He brings to them something new. He brings to them something profound, something greater. And in the midst of that, he flips their understanding and their ideas and their identity and their self-dependence on its ear. He gives them clarity in the face of a lack of clarity and certainty in the face of a lack of certainty. This group of people recognized that they were finite. And what Paul gives them is a God who is infinite. A God who is over and above. And rather than allowing them to dwell in this place of experiencing and expecting the things that they create of their own hands to be what's valuable and worthy, he tells them the exact opposite, that the God of all creation has made them and attributes worth to them because he has made them in his own image. He's made you in his own image. In Acts 17, 24 to 28, Paul illuminates this. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it being Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needs anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth having determined allotted periods and boundaries and the dwelling places that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Here's where it gets important. For in him we live and move and have our being. Even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. See this people of Athens the Greeks, were very focused on art to the point that their art became religion. What they made in art was intended to represent these gods, lowercase g, that they worshipped. So it would not be unusual for you to find places where they were creating images of these gods which never really interacted with them and yet they dedicated their lives to Remember, this is a group of people, we talked about violence in creation a minute ago. God speaks this into being without there being some violent, catastrophic event. And and what we find in the lives of these people, and it's not just merely in Athens, the pagan nature of religion, these people who worship all sorts of things that are not the one true God, wind up having violence play a part in that. And they do that through sacrifice, not of their own selves and their own desires, but they would sacrifice other people to ultimately make way for good things to happen. The amazing thing about the one true God is that he does not call you to sacrifice other people to his benefit. Instead, he calls you to sacrifice yourself, and that does not mean a physical sacrifice in the sense of giving up your life. But it is, in fact, a sacrifice of your will and of your way. And so Paul, recognizing that about this people, about their desire for art and the overlap that exists in religion, goes to this Oropagus, which in English means Mars Hill. They're literally worshiping heavenly bodies. And I'm not talking about angels, I'm talking about planets. They worshiped what they did not understand. And they placed their faith in what amounts to meaningless and worthless creations that they make with their own hands. I mentioned earlier that the original translation said that they were superstitious. And in some ways, they were religious to a fault. 
When we read the word religion, we often think of it as a positive thing. The reality is that religion sometimes is just the mechanism, the the steps that we take that, that doesn't really equate to true faithfulness. Like religion would be thinking that coming to church on Sunday morning is what makes you righteous. It's not how it works. Righteousness comes through Christ and Christ alone. And so these people thought that if they just did enough, if they worshiped enough, if they sacrificed enough, if they gave enough, that they would be able to be equivalent and and worthy, able to attain heaven. It's where Christianity becomes radically different than pagan religions. There's nothing we can do that gains us entrance into heaven. We can never be good enough. We can never give enough. We can never read the Bible enough. We can never pray enough. Instead, the only way to heaven is through Christ and Christ alone. And so you can see how this becomes a bit conflicting for these people. They just think they can try harder and get there. And Paul says, wait a second, you're never going to do that. You're sacrificing true faith for religion. You think that you can confine God into these buildings and these places and these altars and these temples that you create with your own hands. And you act like the things that you give are things that God couldn't get on his own. And God not only makes us, but God has everything. He's the very source of the air we breathe. He is the giver of the blessings that we receive. He is all of it. And all we're intended to do is worship him in word and in deed. Rather than us giving life to God through the things that we create, God gives life to us, his creation. And Paul hits it on the the nail on the head when he says in him we live and move and we have our being see our very identity all that we are the entirety of our potential to be anything is rooted in the God that gives us breath God the creator is what defines us. And I wonder if that's a message and an idea that we need to be reacquainted with this day. That instead of attempting to find our worth and our value in the work that we do, or our worth and our value in the people that we're connected to, or our worth and our value within the expectations and ideas, or with education, or with money in the bank, or cars in the driveway, or clothes in the closet, or shoes on our feet. Is it the stuff that we have that gives us our value, or is it the God who created us that gives us our value? Because the answer is pretty simple. God is the one who gives us our value. The difference is whether or not we understand that and receive it and respond to it. At the end of the day, whether we recognize God's goodness and God's grace and God's provision does nothing to limit God, but it does everything to limit us. Because though God offers grace and love and truth, he expects us to receive it and to respond to it and to be transformed by it and to be submissive to him who has created it all. The very Alpha and Omega has given us life and given us purpose. But are we living like it? See, Paul winds up explaining to the people of the Oropagus that they've been living in ignorance and they're being called to righteousness. And maybe that's a message that's just as much for us today as it was for them. Maybe there are people in this room, maybe every one of us at times chooses to live in ignorance instead of to live in righteousness. Paul challenges them. Connecting back to what he'd said earlier, even some of their poets have said that we are the offspring, his offspring, not knowing who he is. And then in 29, he says, being then God's offspring, that we ought not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the imagination of man. The time of ignorance, the times of ignorance God overlooked, 
But now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world and righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And we know who that man is. That man is Jesus. Earlier in this discourse, Paul talks about being created through one man. He's talking about Adam. He's talking about the dirt. Adam's name literally means dirt. He's talking about this dirt that has been given life through his breath. And it's in that person that we wind up finding sin and brokenness come into the world. But it's in the Son of God, the second Adam, Jesus, who winds up bringing about redemption and righteousness, who in his life and his death and his resurrection washes away sin and death and gives us a hope for the future. Paul knows these things and he teaches these things. And in that moment, he's calling these people from ignorance to righteousness, from ignorance to knowledge. See, God creates us because he desires to know us. In fact, he knows us before we're ever even given being. He knits us together in our mother's wombs and numbers the hair on our heads. He knows us more intimately than anybody does. And if you don't think that happens because our God loves us before we're ever even breathing beings, then you're missing it. Because we'll never create anything close to God. But God creates us in his image so that others can see him at work in us. As Paul calls the people of Athens from ignorance to righteousness... He points out to them that it's not about what they can make, but instead about the fact that God makes them. We are called to that same reality. To know that God gives us life and meaning and movement and being and value and worth and that he does it because he loves us. And that was so radically different than anything they'd ever heard before. See, our God has a purpose for each and every one of us. Calling us from sin and death into life eternal. But we don't get to skip from like death to everlasting life in heaven in the presence of God, right? We have a life to live and and things to do and they're intended to honor God. So may we be a people who honor God in word and in deed. May we recognize that God is more than gold or silver. May we understand that he created us to be more than value of gold and silver too. May we know that God has created us to be known and to know him. That God has created us to believe in him and to place our trust, our faith in him alone. To know that God has created us to live by the example of Jesus. To know that God has created us to go and to take his message of truth and of love and of grace and of righteousness and of knowledge of him to the ends of the earth. May we be a people that are willing to challenge the status quo of the world because the status quo of heaven is so much better. May we be a people that find our value and our worth in God alone. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are the source of our identity. We thank you that you are all that we need. We thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for us that goes far beyond anything that we can comprehend or come up with on our own. And Father, we ask this morning that you would help us not to place our faith in gold and silver in the creation of our own hands, but instead to place our faith in you May you pour out your spirit upon this place. May you help us to understand 
that our purpose is to point others to you. And may we be willing to sacrifice our hopes and our desires for your intent and for your plan and for your will and for your way again and again and again because your way is greater. Thank you for saving us even from ourselves. You are all that we need. In Christ's name we pray, amen.